Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And you're about to hear one of my Genius Network interviews. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And I hope you find it very useful. If you want to find out more information about some of the interviews and resources that can help you in your business, you can go to www.joepolish.com. And we have a Joe Polish Recommends section with all kinds of resources and vendors and services and products that we recommend that can help you in your business. And also for more useful interviews and a whole list of other people that I've interviewed, you can go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and enjoy the interview. Hello, this is Joe Polish. Welcome to Genius Network. Today I've got a guy on the line who's uh, pretty fascinating. His name is Dave Logan. He's uh, written... uh, four or five books, uh, knows a lot of stuff about tribal leadership and many other things. And so, Dave, how are you doing today? Great, Joe. How are where you at? Where, where are you hanging out at right now? Uh, actually, my home in L.A. Wonderful. Okay, well, I'm in, I'm in my home in uh, Tempe, Arizona. So I'm going to formally introduce you with uh, a bio, and then I'm going to really ask uh, who, who is David Logan. So uh, just bear with me as I read the formal introduction of who you are. Dave Logan is a faculty member at the University of Southern California, USC's Marshall School of Business, a best-selling author and management consultant. Having served on the Marshall faculty since 1996, he currently teaches management and leadership in the USC Executive MBA. He is also on the faculty at the Getty Leadership Institute and the International Center for Leadership in Finance, ICLIF. Endowed by the former Prime Minister of Malaysia from 2001 to 2004, he served as Associate Dean of Executive Education at USC. He co-founded CultureSync, a management consulting firm in 1997, and currently serves as senior partner. The firm has worked with dozens of Fortune 500 companies on the intersection between organizational culture and performance. Uh, Dave is co-author of four books, including Tribal Leadership and the Three Laws of Performance. The Three Laws of Performance has been on the bestsellers list of USA Today, The Wall Street Journal, and Business Week. He has a Ph.D. from the Annenberg School at USC. And, uh, you know, you wrote this awesome book called Tribal Leadership, and uh, that's what I want to talk about today, Dave. Uh, But you've also, there's a great presentation of you at TED.com that people would watch, and I would encourage that. But really, uh, who is David Logan? How would you get interested in all of the stuff that you write about, and uh, what do you really teach people? (laughs) <laughs> well, thanks for the intro. The truth is, what I teach mostly is um, for people to, to play the BS card on ideas and advice that just doesn't make any sense, which is 90% of what happens in universities and probably 95% of what happens in business books. Huh. So uh, actually, the, if you talk to people who've been through you know seminars that I do or stuff at USC, the thing that they almost always remember is oh, yeah, Dave, he's the guy who said play the BS card. You know, So they'll, they'll, they'll raise their hand and say, you know, I'm going to play the BS card on this. This is all wrong. This is stupid. This goes against everything I know. And then we get in these you know, great debates. And so what comes out of it is, you know, here's the actual stuff kind of boiled down that really works. If you do this stuff, it works. If you do this other stuff that people talk about, you know, it's kind of obvious. And when it's not obvious, it's, pro- it's often wrong. So that's probably what I'm known for more than anything else. I gotcha. just makes my mother so proud, as you can imagine. <laughs> so, I mean, so what, what caused you to be so fascinated with, the, say, the topic of, uh, of what I want to talk about today is, is tribal leadership. I mean, what got you interested in that? Well, um, tribal leadership, I, I wrote with uh, John King primarily. He's been my business partner at, at Culture Sync since we founded it. We were friends for years before we founded it. And the book is a synthesis between a lot of the things that John brought to the table, a lot of the original ideas. Uh, and then I kind of wove it into cultures. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you have whole groups of people that are, you know, tribes that behave in, in certain ways? So it was kind of putting those ideas in the blender, hitting puree and tribal leadership is what came out. And then Haley Fisher Wright, the other uh, co author, is a medical doctor, and she became really interested toward the end of writing the book. And and just was a was a great partner in the actual writing of it and getting interviews and hopefully the things that make it an interest, an interesting book. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it really comes down to a pretty simple question. What I've just been fascinated by, and probably always will be, is how come the vast majority of, of companies suck? I mean, there's just no better way to say it. They're just they're dysfunctional. Uh, leaders are tyrants. And not that there's anything wrong with being a tyrant, but it also leads to, you know, suboptimal results, like you like to say in the university. So, you know, why is that? And why is it that a few organizations – manage to get it right, and yet somehow those innovations don't seem to spread. I mean, if this were true of anything else, 
you know, in society, we'd fix it. Like if 75% of people in the United States lived in really sucky houses, we'd find a way to fix the 75%. But for some reason, we put up with three-quarters of our businesses, which is the thing that makes the world run, uh, just dramatically underperforming, and everybody loses. Employees, customers, certainly shareholders, and even the people who who run the companies and own them. So, you know, why is that? What can we do about it? So you might say I'm on a mission to make companies not suck. No, well, that's great, that, because I know everyone listening to this, for the most part, would love to be in companies that don't suck, and, and the vast majority of the listeners uh, and people that are involved in Genius Network are actual entrepreneurs and, and run businesses, and certainly uh, I think entrepreneurs, going back to the original definition from uh, John Baptiste Say in the 1800s, which is there, you know, an entrepreneur is an individual that takes resources from a lower level of productivity to a higher level. Uh, I think most people really that would even take the time to listen and expand their thinking really want things to work. They want they don't want something that sucks, and, and so that's what we'll explore today as I as I talk with you. And I know that you've got uh, some of the most unique perspectives uh, and understanding and, and methodologies uh, on this, so that you can not only define what causes it, but the, we can leave people with our conversation at the end with some action steps on, on what to do about it. So how about if I just start with a simple question, uh, such as you have, your, let's say, going back to tribal leadership, you know, what is a tribe? I mean, maybe talk a little bit about uh, what a tribe actually is. Sure. Well, and there's no good word for this in English, and we, we really struggled. Um, John and I are kind of eggheads more than probably Haley was, and so we were originally calling these things uh, NOGs, N-O-Gs, naturally occurring groups, which, you know, is like the least sexy thing you've ever heard in your life, right? And it was actually our editor, uh, a guy named Ethan at HarperCollins, who said, no, 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 we're going to call him something else. So we went on the search for, for what to call it. But the, the thing that Tribe, you know, as a label uh, uh, goes to, is it something bigger than a team and it's smaller than like a big department or a division or, all, or an organization? Tribes fit almost perfectly the entrepreneurial model. You know, a lot of small companies are tribes. So if you want a technical definition, bigger than a team, it starts around 20 people and it goes up to about 150. The Romans noticed if they had bands of soldiers that, that clustered in groups bigger than 150, they lost wars. So the Romans said, you know, duh, we'll make the group smaller than 150. So a centurion became, in essence, a leader of 100. That way you can add a few orphan soldiers, you know, soldiers from another group, and they're still under that 150 mark, and they would win wars. And you look at how well the Romans did for literally thousands of years, and it's a testament to the fact that that number, uh, which comes from a sociologist named Robin Dunbar, by the way. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell also read Dunbar's work uh, for Tipping Point. That's where the number comes from. So as we were looking at, you know, what makes a great organization, I mean, I do a lot of media stuff, and, and you know, microphones are always being you know, put in my face with the question of whatever companies in the news at the time, like recently it was GM, you know, how would you fix GM? And my answer is, I don't know. It's, it's too big. It's too vast. How do you start? But if you think of GM as a cluster of these little tribes, groups of, again, between 20 and 150, and people can be members of multiple tribes, you as a leader could easily, with, with a few techniques and a few, you know, ways to think about it, you could go in and make a single tribe at GM just rock. And then you could do it again, and you could do it again. And if you take a tribe and make it rock, the people in the tribe are going to see what you're doing, so you're making them people that you can spread out, kind of like a flu virus, you know, into all the other parts of the organization, and just have a tip. So it becomes a really not just interesting way to think about organizations, it actually becomes the key to doing wide-scale organizational transformation really quickly and make 75% of companies not suck anymore. Gotcha. Okay. Well, so well, now I'm going to bounce back and forth here because I think this is just totally uh, fascinating. Um, I want to go to culture. Like, what is uh, tribal culture, and how does it really affect not only the, the tribe itself, but the tribes around the tribe? With, I guess, per se, the said culture. Yeah. I mean, the easiest way to think about it is with an example. So, probably like a lot of people who are listening to this, I travel a lot, and one of the groups that I'm always kind of we have this, well, I would say love-hate relationship. It's actually more of a hate-hate relationship with is the TSA, the group that scans you before you get on, you know, a plane. And most people are familiar with this. You just see a bunch of people standing around, and they move really slow, and they, they're certainly not interested in things like excellence or, you know, you mentioned the, the definition of being an entrepreneur, right? There, I mean, there's no entrepreneurial stuff going on. It's actually function we need done, and we need done well. 
And when, and when people, like happened a few months ago, when someone gets on a plane, it's actually happened in Amsterdam, with exploding underwear. I mean, it just doesn't get better than that. Somebody flying with exploding underwear on Christmas Day, you know, as a headline, it doesn't get better than that. You know, we often look for, for like, the systemic failure. So it's got to be about roles and responsibilities, and, and it's, you know, somebody didn't know their job or somebody wasn't held accountable. It's not any of those things. It's a culture of just absolute mediocrity. Right? I mean, where you don't go out of your way to strive for excellence, you don't show any initiative, you don't, you, I mean, you literally, you know, stand around. I missed a flight the other day because there were all these TSA guys standing around, you know, chit chatting. Meanwhile, only one lane was open and we you know, a bunch of people missed flights, you know. So you look at the TSA as a culture, you know, as a, as a group of tribes and say that's really mediocre. And I think what a lot of entrepreneurs are just scared to death by is they don't want their company to in any way become like the TSA. So, you know, original question about, you know, culture, it, it, one definition of culture is it's the way we do things around here. So as entrepreneurs are building great companies, the thing they have to get right more than anything else is the culture. And now that often, you know, sounds like somebody who like hasn't been in the real world. I mean, look, I'm, I've been an entrepreneur for a long, for a, a lot of years. I know what it's like to have you know, a company that's growing 30% a year in really good times, and, I, and I've covered payroll uh, on my visa when we couldn't, you know, had trouble collecting or, or, or times where, so, I mean, I, I, you know, get all that. And even in our little company, when you get the culture right, even if something else is out of whack, like you don't know what your strategy is, you don't know how to add value, you know, you're not up on the latest technology, you'll find a way to tractor beam those resources in and make them work. So if you get a good culture, the other stuff tends to work. And if your culture sucks, which, again, it does 75% of the time, none of that other stuff matters. So if entrepreneurs want to put emphasis in any one single place, and this is counterintuitive, it's actually culture. Okay, so what is the difference between a tribe and uh, a culture? Um, well, they just describe different things. A tribe is a group of between 20 and 150 people, and, a, and every tribe has a culture. So every tribe has a way that it does things. So, you know, again, you go into a tribe at GM, a particular one is going to be like the TSA. The way they do things there is with a lot of mediocrity, moving slow, not a lot of innovation, doing the minimum to not get fired. So when you think of a culture of an organization, for most companies of any size, that actually doesn't exist. There's no such thing as a, as a culture. There are little tribal cultures scattered all throughout the company. That's what you want to focus on. Gotcha. Okay. Now, can I ask you a couple questions about, uh, and then, like I said, I will I will ba uh, bounce back and forth because I want to go through the different stages of tribes that you've broken down and explained because it's it's fascinating and very instructional. Uh, companies like Apple, uh, you know, at the time we were actually having our conversation, I mean, we're talking a company that is absolutely kicking ass, that has a cult-like following, and how do you describe a gigantic organization like that, or say my friend Richard Branson with Virgin United. I mean, they've got cultures within the many different Virgin companies that just seem to work, and people are excited, and they don't believe this sucks. You know, you've you've talked about Zappos on your presentation at TED.com. I actually did an interview with Tony Shea, the CEO at Zappos, on location, and we videotaped a lot of this stuff. So there are big companies with lots of employees that work, and there's many that just... How the hell would you even describe it? Uh, but t talk about Apple as an example. Have you ever thought about their culture and what that represents and, and how to explain it? Yeah, well, it's actually interesting. I was at Microsoft yesterday up in Seattle, and they gave me a hard time because I was doing some consulting work with them. And, of course, I brought my Apple Mac out, and I thought, you know, this is probably a faux pas. So I'm a big fan of Apple. I mean, I'm, their stuff works. You know, you, you just look at it, the, the values of the people who put it together just drip off the product. The idea of, of elegant design, it's got to be cool. You know, Val, Apple really gets it right. And we have interviewed a fair number of people at Apple and, you know, signed a lot of non-disclosure, so I can't, you know, cite names here. But, again, don't think of Apple as a big company. You know, there are parts of it, and I'm, you know, if you're listening to this and you're at Apple, you've heard those stories, that really are more like the TSA. But the parts of Apple that really matter, and I'm talking about product development tribes and tribes that are, you know, they're, that are really doing the stuff that are creating value for the company, those, those are at the very highest level. So I love to tell the story that led to the first Macintosh. At the time, Apple was in a life-and-death struggle with IBM, you know, life-and-death, 
when IBM had, had entered the PC market. And IBM was just using their cloud, their brand, everything else to just kill this poor little company. And so Apple did something that was not really obvious. You know, they, they asked the question within a little tribe, you know, fairly small group, how do we so revolutionize the experience of using a computer, so revolutionize it, that even my mom would use it? And the result was the first Macintosh. And that was so disruptive, you know, to the industry that it wasn't that many months later that IBM just exited the, the personal computer business. I mean, they literally could not compete against that level of, of innovation. The, the, a similar tribe at Apple asked a question about revolutionizing people's experience with music. The result was the iPod. And a very similar, largely overlapping group came up with the iPhone, the iPad. You know, they've just done it again and again and again and again. But if you think of that as a product of Apple, you're actually not seeing what's happening. It's a tribe within Apple, you know, a very small little group with the rest of the company set up to support it and take advantage of it. So, I mean, that's an example of, you know, just crushing it. Uh, yeah, but it's, well, it's, they're crushing it one tribe at a time. Hold on. Okay, that's, that's fascinating. And, and so the thing I wanted to ask you is for, for the listener's uh, perspective is, what's the difference between the tribes and the culture that's created within the company and operates with the company that's producing the products, the services, the experience, uh, versus the customers? Because uh, there seems to be many tribes of, let's take Apple, that just love and support Apple. There's a whole culture within their client base. Is that the same, an extension of the company? Can, it, can the company have a whole group of tribes that think, you know, the company sucks, as an example, but they produce products that create tribes of people that think it's the greatest thing since sliced bread? Oh, yeah. I mean, you go to in, into any Apple store, any Apple retail store, and that's a tribe. you got the people who work there. You've probably got their usual, I mean, there's an Apple store near me, and I spend a bit of time there. There's the usual customers that just kind of hang out there. It's like their, you know, their place to go. So that's a tribe. So every, literally every Apple store is a tribe with people who work there and people who are regular customers. Other members of the tribe might be, the if it's in a mall, the store next door. And so, again, these, these groups, these naturally occurring groups, these tribes, are what determine the performance of that store. And then there are multiple tribes at, at Apple Corporate. And in the example of, of an Apple store, the tribe doesn't care if you are an employee of Apple or not. If you're someone that hangs out there, you are a member of that tribe. You know, the thing that really, the kind of the bottom line of all of this, is people don't need to be taught how to tribe. It's just something we do, in the same way that fish swim and, and birds fly. They don't need to be taught to do it. It's in their genetic code. With, with us as human beings, though, the thing that we don't do very well is we don't form great tribes. So we don't form the top 7, 10 percent of tribes that really rock the world. That requires a lot of thought and a lot of, a lot of effort that doesn't – this may be a little counterintuitive is probably the best way to say it. So that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely, totally does. So is every single person that's listening um, to us right now, wherever they're listening to us at, on an iPod, uh, in their car, uh, wherever, um, are in their living room, uh, you know, on a raft in the, in the middle of a, of a lake, whatever, um, are they all part of a tribe? Is there anyone that isn't part of a tribe? Yeah, there are people who are not parts of tribes, and they're actually really a problem for society because they tend to do things like go postal. Uh, I mean, seriously, a, a person without a tribe is a is a person you actually need to watch, and that's actually what we call stage one. So there are kind of five types of tribes, and the very bottom is the one you don't want. Uh, stage one comes in a couple forms. One is the one we're talking about now, which is the person without a tribe, the social isolate. They have severed all of their contacts, and I mean all of them. They don't have. They're not a they're not a member of a work tribe. I mean, they may go to work, but they're they just they just stick you know to themselves. And what would be an example of one if you if you could give an example oh. of, of a person that people might could could know of? It you know I'm sure it'll be a, a murder or something, someone that you see in the news. Yeah, they, they make the news all the time. Uh, uh, the kid who shot at Virginia Tech, uh, you know, was a loner, and what did everybody say about him? He was kept to himself. Uh, you know, we don't know a lot about that Army major that shot up uh, Fort Hood, but everything I've read indicates that he was probably a loner. You know, the neighbors said he, he was nice, but he really kept to himself. Again, it was, it was a single guy. Now, you know, maybe we'll, they'll come some, they might, we might learn that he's connected to some group at some point. But what we know now is probably a social isol, isolate. I mean, every, at the moment we're talking, pretty much every week there's a story of an office shooting. And the, and the story always plays out the same. There was some interaction, 
that seemed not interesting. You know, a boss is reprimanding an employee for stealing or about to fire somebody, but this stuff happens all the time. And then, and then they switch, you know, almost like they, they, they turn into a different person and they pull out a gun or they pull out a knife and six people are dead and the SWAT team shows up and, you know, usually the person takes their own life. Well, what's going on there? I mean, that's a person without a tribe. So, Joe, if you were me, had some kind of mental dysfunction, we had some mental breakdown, and we started fantasizing, and we thought the CIA was out to get I mean, I know the CIA is out to get you, but <laughs> like for most of us, if we started talking that way, you know, our friends, our family would intervene and say, look, Joe, you're sounding like a crackpot here. You've got to go get help. But if you get somebody without a tribe, there is no safety net. And, of course, the mental dysfunction is one of the things that drove them to sever all the tribal ties in the first place which just reinforces the fact that they live in their own world and then they conjure something with, you know, dragons and, you know, scary creatures and God is talking to them and then they go do this horrific act. So that's one type of stage one. I mean, again, we just hear about that all the time. Gotcha. Okay, fascinating. So, okay, so then how else does uh, stage one show up? What does it look like? And, and let's just go through all the stages. I mean, you have five yeah. stages. This is you're, you're doing it. Let's talk about talk about all of them to take our listeners through all of the different stages, and then we'll we'll talk about what it means to them in their life and their their business and yeah. progress. Well, stage one is the one that's most foreign to most people who are successful, and it is gangs. It is uh, no, not all gangs. Okay, but it's most gangs. It is not all prisons. It's most prisons. And you go different parts of the world where people think that the only way they can distinguish themselves is by strapping explosives on their body and going into a marketplace and blowing it up like we have, you know, big chunks of the world. That's stage one, where you get a, now a tribe that all buys into the idea that life sucks. Life is inherently unfair. You can never cut a break. People, you know, believe all these sort of conspiracy theories, often in stage one groups. And as a result, you will do whatever it takes to distinguish yourself or distinguish your tribe. And if that means killing somebody, you know, you do it. If that means you become a terrorist, you do it. Uh, now, in employed situations, that's really rare. It does happen, okay, when you've got accounting fraud and you've got people. I, mean, I was in a company a few years ago, and, the, and this guy took this big, one of those 11 by 17 printers, really heavy, you know, this was a few years ago before they got light, he was taken out to his car or truck or something, and I helped him because he was obviously about to throw us back out. And when we finally got it into his car, I said, you know, as we were wiping the sweat off our face because the thing was just really heavy, what's the deal with moving the printer? And he said, um, yeah, you know, I got fired today, and those SOBs didn't give me any severance. This is my severance. I mean, that's stage one, right? I mean, life's unfair. I'm getting screwed. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get mine and, you know, screw everybody. That, that kind of raging hostility is stage one. So it only happens, it's only the dominant tribe uh, 2% of the time, okay? So they're very rare in employed situations. Around the world, they lead to terrorism, they lead to all sorts of things. So it's a huge worldwide concern, but as managers, as leaders within our organizations, it's not something we need to spend a whole bunch of time with. So anyway, that's stage one. Yeah. In, in, in your book, Tribal Leadership, you call that on the verge of a meltdown. Right, right. Yeah, because people who spend a lot of time in stage one, their their view of the future is that it's completely bleak. They're, it's devoid of any hope, and, and it will never change. There's absolutely nothing that they can do to make the future of them or the future of their tribe any better. And so you imagine how would a human being behave with no sense of a future at all? And the answer is, look around in parts of the world. There was a, I mean, there was a series of bombings in Baghdad today, and I'm certain if you trace those back, you would find a bunch of state one tribes that are sending representatives out to distinguish themselves in the name of, you know, religion. But it's not about religion. It's about people having no hope. So that's stage one. Okay, great. Thank you for explaining that. Okay, so stage two. Yeah, now stage two is the one we actually, I mean, it's not the, the one we really need to kind of pound on is stage three. But stage two, uh, when we were having fun earlier talking about the TSA or the DMV, those are classic stage two cultures. And the theme there is my life sucks. So it's not that life is unfair. It's just that my life isn't working out so well. And the kind of future that people have in, in these tribes is that it, the future is just kind of a bummer. You know, if I'm working at the TSA, where am I going to be in 20 years? Probably in the same place. Uh, probably going to work a regular shift. Probably going to go home, sit in my, you know, lazy boy recliner, pop a, pop a generic beer open and watch Springer. You know, it's probably going to be where I am in 20 years. So it's not hopeless. It's just couldn't be less inspiring, right? 
And so the kind of behavior that results is just apathy. And, again, look at a TSA, look at a DMV. You know, not all of them. I mean, there are some TSA cults because they're tribes, right? There's not a single monolithic, you know, TSA culture. But, but if you look at most TSA groups, they're stage two. Now, in across all organizations, okay, stage two is dominant one in four times. So 25% of tribes, employed tribes, are stage two. And you know them because they get the minimum amount of work done to not get fired. Uh, if you came along and said, you know, hey, guys, let's innovate. Let's do something really radical. Let's shake it up. There's kind of a pseudo-wisdom in stage two, and it would say, no, we tried that before. You know, we tried that in 95, and it didn't work then, and I got all excited. I just got disappointed. So this two, it just wait. This will go away. You know, just go back to your office or your cube, drink your coffee, space out for 20 minutes, pretend to do work, and don't worry about it. That's kind of the pseudo-wisdom of stage two. And unfortunately, in a recession like we're you know, in right now, or the perception is we're in a recession, a bunch of people think that they're just kind of screwed in their life walking you know, in the door. So you as a boss didn't do anything to make your people's lives suck. It's that they, their house is underwater and their you know, neighbors are getting foreclosed on. They're not sure how they're going to get their kids into college or pay for aging parents. And you know, you didn't, that's not your fault, but unfortunately you have to deal with the consequences of it, which is whole ranks of employees showing up in this just kind of state of, of apathy and despondency. You know, my favorite thing is, like, imagine that you're, like, at the TSA, you know, you're with a group of you kind of call everybody over, you know, you're the boss, and, you know, we're going to bring in Joe, this great motivational speaker who works with some of the best brightest, smartest geniuses around the world, and like you talk about life filled with opportunity and possibility, you know, just imagine what the result would be. You know, a little puddle of drool would kind of form in the corner of their mouth, and it would, <laughs> you would get absolutely no traction. So <laughs> there are ways we can change uh, stage two, but things like trying to motivate them or inspire them or, uh, you know, kind of call them losers, <laughs> which is what a lot of people try to do, those are completely ineffective. And as a result, we've got whole organizations, whole industries that are dominated by stage two. You know, and we know them because they're the companies that we love to hate. Right, right, exactly. Uh, very good. Very good. Now, can I ask you one thing uh, kind of uh, an aside? Would what is taking place in a company, say 25% of employed people are stage two, would, would you also take that same percentages to, say, like the United States? Uh, no. Actually, the numbers are worse in the, in the U.S. because when you talk about people who are employed, they're higher up in the tribal stages. So, like, I have no idea what percentage of the U.S. population is stage one, but if you talk about, you know, a lot of problems that we have with, with violence and, and kids at risk and things like that, we're not talking about employed people. We're talking about the population in general. The percentage of stage one would be, would be much higher. I have a sociologist friend who was reciting some research and said it, it may be as high as 37% for stage one in the U.S. Now, I don't have any way of knowing if that's, if that's accurate or not. So stage two is actually much bigger in the U.S. than 25%. The problem is the people who, you know, spend a lot of time there, that's how they talk, that's how they think, they don't, they don't hold jobs for long, or if they do, they're marginally employed. So when we go into companies, you know, John or Haley or I, and we look around to see what, what tribal stage is dominant, a lot of those people just aren't at work. Well, let's go to stage three, and then I'll ask you about that, because I, I love what you talk about where uh, the liability cultures are stage one to three. Uh, right. Let's define stage three, and then uh, um, I'd like to get your perspective on what percentage of companies and what percentages um, of, of, like, say, the United States, although I know this applies worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, but, but would actually fit into those uh, you know, from the best that you can describe it. Sure. Well, stage three is the one that that really rings rings home for most uh, for most people. The theme of it is I'm great. You know, as a person, I'm great, and you're not. So, you know, Joe, if you and I were to you know talk, and before we started recording, we were kind of like doing the guy banter back and forth. I mean, it's right. classically stage three. You know, like with Joe. You know, I I, I know you think you like your, your friend. You you got your little genius friends. You got a little genius network. You know, that's really cool, but. You know, look, Joe, I mean, you, don't, you, you really don't know squat. I mean, you know, you're talking to a guy with a Ph.D. I've been on a university faculty for like 15 years. Um, you, you know, give me a break, Joe. You really – so that would be kind of the tone of stage three. And then, of course, you'd come back and say, you know, you'd make some derogatory comment about education and you'd talk about the people you're connected with. We, like, we go back and forth. Right, and, right. And it's kind of, you know, especially when it's guys, it's sort of good-natured humor. Uh, but 
imagine whole groups that do that, and you find them all the time in organizations. There are law firms, there are groups of medical doctors, there are groups of salespeople. You know, sales is just classically stage three. Uh, I mean, I was at a sales conference not too long ago, a big one in Vegas, and, and it was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people, and you'd see people walking, you know, this big place in, in, in Vegas, and they'd see somebody that they'd know, and they'd run up and say, hey, how did you do last year? And this is, this is a group that makes a lot of money, you know, certainly compared to the U.S. population. And they would say, you know, I had it 2.4 million last year. How'd you do? And if the person did better, they'd say, oh, man, I did 3.2. Kick your ass. And they'd kind of high-five each other. And, you know, but, and then as the, as the person who did 2.4 would walk away, you know, but watch out next year, man. My market was down. I'm coming back. I'm going to kick your ass next year. And that was like this whole meeting that went on for three days. So you see those all over the place. And there's nothing wrong with them. The problem is when you look at things like innovation, the need to really collaborate, the need to come together, the need to have a common vision to do something important, you just get none of that in stage three. It, and so, like Joe, if you and I were in that kind of a culture and we're all kind of working for these supposedly corporate objectives, if I can find a way to make you look really bad uh, in pursuit of my own goals, I'm going to do it. Because the goal is not to be great. The goal is to be better. So if I can make myself look good by making you look stupid, I'm absolutely going to do it. And so, you know, there are three industries or three the kind of organizations that haven't really changed in the last several hundred years. You know, here they are. The Catholic Church is one. They've still got the basic structure, and I'm not, not down on the Catholic Church, okay? I mean, there's a reason why it hasn't changed. Um, but another group is the military. You know, and again, I'm not down on the military. In fact, I think a lot of them are military. And then the third group is academia, which I am kind of down on, because unlike the military and uh, unlike the Catholic Church, the mission of academia has really changed. But you wonder, why is academia so slow to change? Well, the reason is it's, it's almost completely dominated by stage three. I mean, you know, how do you get to be a, a person of power at a university? You know, you get a Ph.D. and you get tenure and you do research and you know, all of your colleagues say that you're one of the smartest people in the room and you go and you teach classes and everybody just applauds at how smart and cool you are. And you get a committee of people like that that's supposed to chart the future, you know, of that institution and they can never make a decision. So, you know, and stepping out of academia because that's not most people, a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurial firms actually fail to get over this barrier because they, they set up stage three. You know, I'm great. I'm the founder. I'm the person that started this thing. I'm the person who found the venture capitalists, and, you know, it's my show. And you get the salesperson saying, well, you know, sure, they've started it, but, you know, I'm the guy really making it happen. And you get the lawyer saying, you know, if it weren't for me, you guys would have been sued years ago. I mean, this is, look, if I, if I stopped coming to work, you guys would be so screwed. You know, imagine that whole kind of company thinking that way. That's actually a lot of startups. That's a lot of startups. And you wonder why they don't really grow, why they don't go after new markets or find new products, why life is just so slow. It's because they're dominated by I'm great. And that across employed cultures is 48% of tribes. So that's actually the dominant one. And as I'm sure the you know, listeners have kind of figured out, so Joe, if you and I are engaged in this thing like I'm great and you're not, and you say, no, I'm great, you're not, and we go back and forth, and we each kind of plan our cards, and we you know, go to humor, and we go to like relationships, and we go to whatever we need to go to to prove that you know, I'm great and you suck, and no, 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 I'm great, you suck, and eventually one of us loses, that person will go to stage two. So one of the reasons that stage two is so common 25% of cultures is because stage three is so common. I mean, if I'm great, I need minions to, you know, make my copies and get me coffee and, and make all that, like, accounting mumbo-jumbo that I really care about because I'm way too smart to think about that. Like, I, I need armies of minions. And so I get them, and they are armies of minions, and basically they've, they form these kind of stage two cultures. And then I get so frustrated that I'm, I'm not surrounded by cool, star, genius people like me. Well, right, they are dumb. They're not dumb because their IQ is low. They're dumb because the culture's dumb, and you made it that way. And we don't realize that. And the almost guaranteed way to make yourself a stage three person is you go back to school and get something like a, a, an MBA or a PhD or an MD. And, you know, again, I'm in the education business, so mea culpa. But you get most MBAs coming out of school, and they talk that way. No matter what the problem is, I've seen it before. I can solve it. Let me add it. And you wonder why stage three is so common and stage two is so common, because that's what really drives companies. And it doesn't need to be that way. You, you, you really gave me a, a perspective on uh, something I'm going to have to think about, but I tend to just, um, you know, I, I tend to learn as I talk. Um, 
one of the things that I see continuously with uh, people that are smart, bright people, but that have an arrogance about them. Uh, and a lot of it is, is, is authors. A lot of it is, uh, you know, professors. A lot of it are, are many people that are in the public limelight that have written a best-selling book uh, that teach seminars that are, quote-unquote, you know, gurus in some level, where when they get to a certain point, they, you know, they believe their own PR so much that they become uncoachable, that they quit learning. And, I mean, I know I can't imagine you've not experienced this in, in droves in, uh, you know, the academic world, in my world of, uh, you know, being involved with information marketers and many people that are seminar leaders. I, I tend to really build my tribe around people that, that are not arrogant, Right. Uh, that I consider, you know, massive value creators in the world. You know, I'll, I'll just, uh, I won't name names of bad people because, you know, I, my, my goal is not to make someone look bad. I'll name a name of someone who, like, say, like Dan Sullivan, who is just a, a brilliant, smart guy that has, he's the founder of a company called Strategic Coach, uh, you know, one of the highest level uh, coaching organizations in the world, and just an all around wonderful human being. And I've known Dan you know, for over 13 years and just, just a fantastic human being and, and, and doesn't have an ego, doesn't have arrogance and, and really is, is, is a contributor. And I know other people that uh, are really bright and smart, but they, they're just arrogant and they think they know it all and they just don't learn very well and they, they drop, you know, if you're going to get into a conversation with them, many of these people, when they first started, I, I felt uh, that they were at a higher level, but they dropped down because they're always getting in debates of, you know, my stuff's better than your stuff sort of thing. Right. And I think that defines a lot of the teaching world that's out there because they believe just because you can get in front of a group of people or you can be influential or you can get on television or you can make, you know, millions of dollars that, that somehow your status, uh, you know, is, is, is more important than any of the other contributions you could make to to your life and to the world and to your family and on and on and on. Right. I mean, is that accurate at all? Or uh, Well, yeah, I mean, totally. I'll, I'll tell you that the, I mean, there's a couple stories that really speak to the points you're, you're raising. One is uh, you and I both know Tony Shea at Zappos. Yeah. And I'm sure you get this all the time. Uh, you know, at the time you and I are talking, Tony's book's been out for a little while and it's doing really well. And after everybody wants to interview Tony, and if you actually read his book or you listen to his message, I mean, really listen to it, the message is it's not about Tony. It's about a group of people. You know, Tony did help to bring them together, and certainly there's a role that Tony played, including incredible sacrifice when Zappos was about to go under. And you know, I mean, he really did a lot. But if you actually talk to the guy, it's not a story about Tony. It's a story about Zappos. The problem is the people who write stories for newspapers and blogs, that, that's not a great way to tell a story. You know, it's all got to be like this hero's journey crap. So, you know, when was your call to adventure and when did you know that you were special and, and, and what was your road of trials? I mean, this was, you know, this is the, this stuff became the basis of the Star Wars movies. And it's really powerful stuff. It's just all stage three. And so the way that the Tony Shea story gets written is that here's this bright guy fighting against the odds in the middle, in the middle of, the, of the dot-com implosion but because he's really smart and he's really determined and a little quirky, you know, he made it work. So you should be smart, you should be determined, you should be quirky too. That's not the story. But yet that's what the press is trying to tell. And in the case of our book, you know, I mentioned in the beginning, well, this is really a story about our tribe, about John uh, and Haley and, and Jack Bennett and, and uh, Bonnie Solo and, and Ethan, our, our original editor. I mean, just it's a whole story. But when you tell that story, everybody just kind of, like, that's just what you're supposed to say, right? But now let me t tell me how you, Dave, wrote this book. Well, I didn't. It was a group. It was a tribe that came together. Without John, there'd be no book, you know? Um, and I think John would say the same about me. But yet nobody wants to hear that. In fact, the, you know, and I think we got a great publisher. It's HarperCollins. But um, when we originally wanted to add Haley as an author, making three authors, they said, well, you know, but then it's not as cool a story because, you know, really, a book should be written by one person because then you get to go on Oprah and you get to go on TV and you get to become famous and it's all about you. Well, that's such a disconnect. I mean, if you're, if you're telling a story, which we are, about how to form great tribes, and it's not about the person, it's about the tribe that they form. But, you know, I, Dave, the superstar, I'm here to tell you how to make great tribes. That couldn't be more of a disconnect. But yet that's the story that everybody wants to hear. So, you know, and do they all want to hear it because of the stage they're in? Exactly, exactly. And the story about a person overcoming the odds, 
that's the template, you know, that, that we have. I mean, and if this is going, you know, to, like, frou-frou, you know, tell me and we can, like, edit it out or something. But if you think about, like, the hero's journey, you know, again, that, that's the Star Wars saga, you know, from Luke's story all the way through to the end, including the thing his dad did in the, you know, prior movies. Joseph Campbell laid all that out. So at the end of the movie, at the end of, you know, where Luke has now defeated the, you know, evil guy and evil is vanquished and all that, that's the start of the tribal story. This is the start of it. Because now, you know, Luke has to go out and he has to form a group of people like him where he's not the leader, but he's a member. You know, he might be sort of the organizer. He might say he's like the Tony Shea of that group, the rebuilding of the Jedi and things like that. But nobody wants to tell that story. It's, it's got to be Luke's story. You know, it's the, it's the person. It's the hero. It's the hero CEO. It's the hero entrepreneur. And that's like a little crack hit for our society. We just love that stuff. The problem is it's just not how life works. Interesting. Yeah, you you that that is one of the that is one of the most eye-opening uh, ways that I've thought about looking at at what has really been adopted as uh, you know so many movies, so many books, so much uh, everything. I mean, and we and it's 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 not how li- you know it's not how life works. Um, there's you know there's this. I have a friend uh, who's a doctor that made this comment. Uh, he's an, he's an addiction doctor. And he talks about how people in society they'll, they'll look at movies and they'll look at movie stars and they'll they'll, they'll want to replicate their their life around it. And he's like, you know, if you watch a James Bond movie, and he goes, and I'll watch a James Bond movie, and he'll be like, I am, I just think it's so cool, you know, that this guy could live this way. He could have all these different women, and he could have all these powers, and he could be strong, and he could be socially completely capable to you know you can just do all this stuff and he's like but you know and i shouldn't think about my life and you know my life just doesn't work like that and nobody's life works like that yeah. and people and if you were to watch you know a real life story called which is not reality tv i mean it would just never be what what is portrayed uh, on television and uh, yeah. yeah very interesting very interesting so what do you do with all of that well, the big insight that comes out of all of that for entrepreneurs and, and, you know, geniuses and leaders is we call it the tribal leadership epiphany. Uh, we, we, we interviewed all these people for the book, a total of about 24,000 people that, that we collected data on. We didn't interview 24,000 people, but, you know, we really then tried to um, go out and find people that were typical of what we'd found in, in collecting all this data and doing all this work. And we, we heard person after person tell the story about how, they were walking to work one morning, um, you know, taxi or limo, whatever, dropped them off. They are walking the, the few feet, and it hit them that my whole life is about me. It's not about my company. It's not about the group that I'm supposedly leading or the group that I'm the face of or something like that. It's really about me. It's all about me. And when you have that realization, it gives you then the ability to do something about it. You know, it's funny, uh, late in... Uh, after Mother Teresa died, some writings came out, including some writings about her. And you know, and I'm, if you cobbled together all, all the analysis, one of the things that even Mother Teresa really struggled with, uh, especially toward the end of her life, was you know she would do great work, and people would say, "Wow, Mother Teresa, you're just such an amazing person." And there was a little part of her, you know, inside her brain, that would say, "You know, I'm pretty effing good, right? I mean, I'm Mother." Evan Teresa, you know, look at me, you know, look at me, I'm, I'm doing all this good stuff, I'm helping the poor, I'm, you know, doing God's work, I'm, I'm great, right? So if Mother Teresa dealt with it, or people like Desmond Tutu deal with it, then certainly, you know, the Dave Logans and, and the Joe Polishes of the world need, need to deal with it, and probably people listening to this need to deal with it. The, the weird dynamic is the minute you think that your ego is not an issue, your ego is an issue. Right. <laughs> the minute you think it's handled or it's like checked off a list, you never check it off. Or if somebody's got a way to do it, I really hope you'll contact me and, and let me know what it is because I'd love to do it for myself and then let other people know what it is. As good as it gets is you've got to hold the tension between all these people saying what a superstar you are and your commitment to the group. You've got to hold that tension and you've got to keep your ego you know, in front of you. And the minute you lose sight of it or think it's handled or that you've somehow transcended it is the minute that you're just an egomaniac running around doing the I'm great thing. Well, yeah. Exactly. You know, that's, get what, out of that. yeah, that, that's, what, that's what I see with a lot of people is when they, you know, when they actually get to the point where they think they've evolved. And, I mean, everyone has an ego, and I, uh, no one's going to eliminate every aspect of stuff, at least from my, you know, uh, my perspective. And 
some people would say, well, I'm not evolved enough to see that, but, you know, whatever. Uh, it's just a matter of keeping the ego in check, and, uh, and, and a lot of people simply simply don't. And I think hearing you explain it and the way you break it down is, is one of the best ways to really understand what not only causes, you know, humans to operate and function, but, but also yourself. Let's talk about the other stages then, stage four yeah. and stage five. Sure. So four is, the theme of it is we're great. And so a lot of people hear that and they think that that's, uh, oh, okay, I see, right, it's a simple message. I'm not supposed to say I or me or mine. I'm supposed to say we and our and us, and then I guess if I'm at stage four. No, actually, that's not it at all. A lot of people who say we really mean themselves, you know, and that just happens all the time, where, where especially corporate leaders will stand up and say, you know, we've picked this new strategy, we've picked our set of values, and people listening to it say, you know, who the hell is we? So a lot of people say we when they mean I, and that's actually stage three. It's just kind of a weirdo form of stage three. So the real thing that drives stage four, the thing we've kind of been ignoring up until now, is the commitment to values or the commitment to, I don't care what you call it, standards, principles, uh, a vision, something bigger than you, where your commitment and everybody's commitment to that is so high that it drives every or at least touches every single conversation that people in that tribe have. And when that becomes the case, you're, you transition to stage four. So, you know, I love taking people to Zappos and send them on the tour, especially people who are in these kind of like anal retentive jobs, you know, like bankers, and they come back and they're like twitching a little bit and they kind of need to do detox because it's been weird and they've seen people do conga lines and having chili parties and, and what's up with all that stuff? And that's weird. I could never do that where, where, where I work. Well, right, that's the point. The point of Zappos is not to do that stuff, because if your company did it, it would just be weird, right? So the point is, you've got to find your values, the values of your tribe, by finding the values of each person in your tribe, seeing the values that cut across people, and then committing to those values with, with as much passion and maybe even as much weirdness as Zappos commits to theirs. And when you start doing that, what happens really, you know, instantly is that problems that were unsolvable suddenly become not at all an issue. You know, a lot of companies that I've seen had major problems like failed product launches or the number of new customers hits a plateau or uh, customers get pissed off about something that happens. You can't find funding and, and you're about to run out of cash. I mean, these things tank companies all the time. A stage four tribe can sit down and figure out what to do with that in an hour and implement whatever decisions they come up with the next hour and two or three hours later could have solved a problem that can dog a stage three tribe for decades. You know, and, th and that's why the Zappa story is so fun, is they just do that again and again and again and again and again. And it looks so easy and it looks so effortless. And you say, wow, if only I, you know, I, could, if only I could do that in my company, maybe I should be more like Tony Shea. No, that's the stage three road. It's not about that. It's, you know, when we could talk about Pixar, we could talk about Apple, we could talk about parts of GE or Lockheed Skunk Works. It's traditionally been a stage four group. I mean, these things are all over the place. But when you walk into a stage four group, it just seems so easy and it seems so effortless. And, you know, as, as a, at least part-time academic, I love asking people questions like, uh, you know, why do you, do you trust people that you work with? And if you go into a stage four group, they'll say, well, yeah, sure, I trust people. I mean, why wouldn't I? Well, I mean, okay, but how did, how did they earn your trust? Well, what, what do you mean how they earned my trust? I just trust them. Well, okay, but why did you decide to trust them? Why are you asking me such stupid questions? I just trust people who work here. Well, okay, what would you do if someone broke trust? Wow, you're really like an idiot, aren't you? I would go talk to them, and I would sort it out. Well, what if you couldn't sort it out? I don't know. We'd figure it out. I mean, that's what people in Stage 4 groups say all the time. If you ask those same questions in Stage 3, the stuff you'd learn could easily be a doctoral dissertation about how trust is broken and restored and rebuilt. And stage four groups just don't have that issue. They assume trust, they give it away, and if somehow trust is violated, they repair it, and then they move on in real time and without a lot of drama and without a lot of friction. It's just easy. So that's stage four. Uh, that's great. <laughs> I love it. Uh, okay, stage five, which would be the uh, the 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 the, uh, the big daddy uh, of, of stages, right? Right, and interestingly, you know, with your work in, in genius um, stuff, you know, Joe, I think it resonates. This we sometimes call stage five a genius tribe. So it's not it's not a tribe filled with individual geniuses all saying I'm great. That'd be stage three, and it's not even a group of geniuses saying we're better than that other genius group over there. Right, we're great. They suck. That'd be stage four. But where you get the genius kind of transcending to the tribal level, 
So now we as a tribe are a genius, and the only thing we live to do is express our genius in some way, to make a meaningful contribution to a group, you know, to a person, whatever. That's all we live to do. So values go from being important, which is stage four, they tell us who we are, you know, our values kind of unite us, and, you know, that's important, but it's not like, you know, mega important. At stage five, values become vital, which literally means, if you look at the etymology, life-giving. So without our values, we would have no idea who we are. So one thing about stage four is you've usually got a, some sense of a competitor. You know, we're, we're trying to outperform that other group. And often you get a big company that's a bunch of little stage four clusters. Often the competitor is inside the same company. So like you might have engineering that thinks marketing just sucks. And you go into marketing and they say, no, engineering just sucks. You know, and marketing says if only engineering would give us something that – you know, wasn't really stupid, we could sell it and make a fortune. Then you get engineering say, we give these people gold all the time, and they can't sell their way out of a paper bag. So often the rival is, is inside. Sometimes it gets a little diffuse, and it's kind of like the industry. But when it transitions to something like, you know, cancer or poverty, uh, you know, that's where you really make the transition to stage five. So the theme of it is life is great, but don't hear in that kind of boundless optimism or naivete. It's more like uh, Desmond Tutu's process of truth and reconciliation after apartheid. That was not, you know, in many ways a happy process. It was gut-wrenchingly honest. But the values that drove it are in the name. It's all about truth. We have to discuss everything that happened in the, you know, dark days of apartheid and the, and the days when it was ending, including violence and homicide and rape and all sorts of terrible things. We've got to face the truth of what happened. And then we need to reconcile as a society. And only if we do those things can we rebuild our society after this trauma that's gone on. That's stage five. So it's an absolute commitment to values. The values tell us who we are. And values go from being kind of our shared values to resonant values. So if I can find another group, if I'm in a stage five, you know, sort of a genius tribe, and I can find another genius tribe that's operating in a different area and they've got a different commitment and their values are not our values, but it all kind of resonates, you know, like I, 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 when, they're value, when they're talking their values, I mean, I really, I feel it, but it, I'm not a member of their tribe, but I certainly am supportive of what they do. So you get that resonance. You get these stage five tribes that can, that can um, work with other stage five tribes all around the world. And the thing I'm so excited about is there does seem to be a coming together of a lot of these groups that's just sick and tired of the way the world works and wants to change it. So I just think that's incredibly cool. Uh, yes, absolutely, and and I want to um, I want to ask you about values. Um, before I do that, though, I, I'd like to ask uh, who is your favorite tribal leader and and why. Oh, that's a good. Do one. You have one. Um, well, so a tribal leader is somebody who builds the tribe, and then when the tribe gets up to stage four, the tribe then embraces the person as the leader. So that, that's kind of the dynamic. Uh, from history, it would be George Washington, actually took a bunch of disconnected groups, wealthy landowners in Virginia and, um, you know, politicians in the Continental Congress, and united those different groups as stage four and then linked them all together with common values that they all had in the groups. Um, so so uh, historically it would be, um, it would probably be George Washington. Um, you know, currently, uh, corporately, I mean, I know of a lot of, you know, people that you've never heard of because they're just kind of quietly doing the stuff in their businesses or their you know, not-for-profit organizations. Um, you know, I would look at a guy like Tony. I think he's a, he's a very effective tribal leader. And at the moment, you and I are talking very much in the news. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot of them. And you, you mentioned Richard Branson. I've seen Bran, Branson do some really effective stuff, again, just coming from Microsoft. I think of, of uh, a lot of the work that Gates has done since he retired from Microsoft and the Gates Foundation. Um, or um, the uh, Moores, uh, Gordon and Betty Moore, with the foundation named after them. And it, it, that's a place up in uh, San Francisco that is just filled with, with wall-to-wall tribal leaders. It's just amazing. Right, so right. I don't know, there's a bunch of them. Well, and, the, and the reason I wanted, to, I, I just wanted to, you know, have people paint pictures of who certain individuals are before I then ask you to talk about values. And, and I, uh, you know, you, like for instance, uh, Desmond Tutu as an example. Um, let me ask you about him for a moment. I've met Desmond before, an incredible human being. Um, why do you feel a guy like him, as uh, as a tribal leader, I would say, is able to have conversations in such a way that others could not to affect the change that he did? 
Well, first of all, he comes across as incredibly humble. And there's also something just in terms of personal branding that's really unique about him, you know, as an American or, or somebody not in South Africa. The guy's Yoda. I mean, you know, he's like, I'm exaggerating here, but he's like four foot tall. You know, he likes to wear kind of green tie-dye T-shirts, especially now that he's retired from the Anglican Church. And, you know, he's funny. He's goofy. He goes around making jokes and laughing, and, you know, I mean, this is a character. He's totally goofy, right? I mean, he, he makes a joke that nobody really understands, and he laughs at it, and then you kind of understand. But it's funny because Desmond Tutu's laughing at his own joke. So the guy's Yoda, right? And, he's, and he doesn't, you know, he certainly has an ego because he's a human being, but he's not, he's not run by it. And, it. and ego is just so incredibly distasteful. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm happy to go and name names, but, like, there's somebody here in California that's running for an office that, that I uh, have met, and I just couldn't be more turned off by this person. And I can't figure out why everybody's not turned off by this person, uh, because it, the person is just dripping ego, uh, and it's so clearly all about them. So, you know, so I, I look at a guy like Desmond Tutu as just being, you know, the antithesis of that. So part of it is he's goofy, he knows who he is, he's... He, really comfortable in his own skin. He doesn't take himself seriously. He, you know, will, he'll blunder. He'll literally trip on the way to a stage and laugh about it for the next five minutes. Of, and he meets people all the time, like uh, Brad Pitt, and, he, and it, he makes it seem like he's so honored to be in their presence. And the truth is, he really is honored to be in their presence. That's the kind of guy he is. So it's not a lot of, you know, pretense. So for him to get to where he was, like the rest of us, he had to move through stage two, you know, the point of establishing a career and having some setbacks, and he had to move into stage three, and he had to move into stage four, which, you know, I know you want to get to values. That's the only way you get to five. You've got to move through those stages, and, you know, pardon the, pardon the cliche, but it really is one stage at a time. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so let's talk about what are, uh, what are values. Values are always fascinating to me, so I'd love to get your perspective on them. Well, yeah, and I'll just I'll just give you mine again. If if John were on the phone, he'd have a he'd have a little different a little different take. But uh, first of all, I've read a lot of the research in values. I did a lot of it in grad school. It, pretty much, if something comes out, if there's a book on it or an article, even pre-publication, I tend to read it. And a lot of the stuff about values, I, I want to say, is really not useful for the discussion that we're having right now, because. You know, as a researcher, a lot of people try to come up with a list of values, or it's called a taxonomy or a typology of some kind of values, and that's really not where the gold is. I was, I was working with one guy recently, and he was trying to find the values of his tribe, and it was this you know interactive process. And he called, and I was on vacation. I couldn't really hear him because I was on my cell phone, and it was a place that didn't have great cell phone coverage. And and he said, I, I, I we found the value, and it's so cool. And okay, what is it? Are you, are you sitting down? And then my phone kind of crackled out, and I thought I heard him, but it couldn't quite be that goofy. So then he repeated it, and it really was that goofy. He said, our value that really unites us as a tribe is we are going to embrace our inner awesome, which I have to say I don't quite get, but it's not important that I get it. It's important that he gets it, the people in the tribe get it. So what a value is, if you want a definition of not just a value, but a core value, which are the ones that really drive this stuff, values are kind of in a hierarchy. So like everybody values money. You know, I mean, you do, I do, everybody does pretty much. Even Desmond Tutu, if you were on the call, he'd say he values money too. But if money becomes a core value for you, there's nothing underneath it, there's nothing supporting it, you want it just because you do, then you're a sociopath and we should probably lock you up. So for most people, if they say money's important and you ask, well, why, you know, or in service of what, you'll get something else. You'll get a deeper value, a more core value. And so if you keep chasing values, you'll eventually find some below which there is nothing. It's like you've stepped off the cliff and there's just empty air. That's a core value. And for, you know, for every person, for you, me, every person listening to this, if we mapped your values and how they connect to each other, it's as unique as a fingerprint. So you as, a, you know, as somebody who's going to lead a tribe, you've got to know your values inside out. Uh, one thing that's certainly true of leaders, and this is, you know, a lot of people have said this even going back to the Greeks, leaders know themselves better than non-leaders. You just have really good self-knowledge. So you need to know your values, all of them, how they connect, how they intersect. And there's a whole, you know, tool, there's a whole um, set of tools about how you find your values. And then you also have to know the values of everybody in your tribe and how they all connect, and then you have to look for the values that could successfully cut across this group. So 
uh, getting back to you know the, what is a core value, one of the things we said in tribal leadership in the book is that a core value is a principle without which life isn't worth living. So for a lot of people, creativity might be in that category or you know, making an impact or making a difference with other people. If I couldn't make a difference, but I got everything else I wanted, I got money, I got job autonomy and everything else, but I couldn't really do that, I'd probably quit. There'd be no point in staying. Uh, for me, learning is one of those values. If I'm not learning, I'm dying. So right. if he gave me the coolest job in the world that had no capacity for me to learn and for other people to learn as a result, it, uh, it's a non-starter. So that's a little bit about what values are. You know, that's great. Now, I want to ask you, because I've heard you talk about Martin Luther King and Gandhi and about the values and how they actually would speak in terms of different stages and stuff, um, where Martin Luther King and Gandhi literally got pissed, I mean, in order to, um, you know, effect change. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's a great way to kind of explain uh, uh, your, your perspective on, on values. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, when people get really pissed off, usually a lot of us get kind of scared because we're not really sure what to do with anger and it's not supposed to happen. Well, you become angry. You know, you as a person or somebody in your tribe becomes angry for one of two reasons. Either they've got some kind of projection going on. So unconsciously, when they look at you, they see their dad and they're actually mad at their dad. Okay, that's not, there's not a lot of value stuff going on there. I mean, there's some, but it's, it's more like just psychological crap that they need to deal with. But aside from that, if somebody gets really angry out of proportion to what's going on, it's because whatever is happening is violating one of their values. It's actually violating one of their core values. So a lot of us like to think of, of leadership and this value stuff as being, uh, you know, warm and soft and fuzzy and it's happy land and it's kind of like we go back to when we were kids and we're all just running around blissfully. And it's actually not that. Uh, Martin Luther King got pissed, you know. He got really pissed. And when you hear his... His speeches, among other things, there's real anger coming through in his voice about this betrayal of American values, that America was not living up to its promises. And same thing with Gandhi. You know, even though he was a quiet man and very spiritual and so on, he got pissed. So there's nothing wrong with getting pissed. In fact, often getting pissed is the thing that makes you aware of the fact that something is, is profoundly violating your values and you just have to do something. You know, this will not stand. And, I mean, that's a wonderful thing. When you get a whole tribe that gets that angry, this cannot be, but then shifts out of the negative mode into let's do something about it so that you don't just fall victim to it. That would be stage two. But uh, we know what value this, the current situation is violating, and we are, you know, damn it, going to make something happen. That's where you get a group at stage four. And, you know, the other thing about, about Martin Luther King is when you go through the tribal stages, especially two, you know, I love asking people the question, in seminars and things. So do you know any good leaders or whoever talked stage two? Would a good leader ever say that? Kind of my life sucks. And almost always they say no. You know, no, no, no. I mean, you, you never talk like you're, you know, at the TSA or the DMV. I mean, why would you waste your time? And the answer is actually that's dead wrong. You know, you look at Churchill's speeches in World War II, and a lot of them start off as bad as you think things are. They're actually much worse. You know, so why would he do that? Because people can only hear one stage above and below where they are at that moment. And so for Churchill, he realized a lot of the population, you know, he realized this intuitively, I mean, the scheme hadn't been worked out, that a lot of the population was at stage one, you know, despairing hostility, life is unfair, this isn't right. And a bunch of them were at stage two, my life sucks, it's, the, you know, war's not going to go well, I'm not sure that I'm going to have enough food, this really sucks. So when he came in and talked that way, he got everybody's attention, and he resonated uh, with everybody in those stages, and he didn't stop there. He didn't move in every single speech to stage three. Would talk about what he's doing, you know, kind of the I'm the I'm great thing. And so the thing is, when when a leader gets really pissed, when a tribe gets really pissed, you want to convert that into number one instant knowledge of what is our value that's been violated, because that that's why that's why people get so angry. And then if you the other often question that comes up about Martin Luther King is. You know, would a good leader like ever talk in terms of stage two, you know, like the DMV would talk or the TSA or stage three, you know, I'm great. And usually people say no. Good leaders would never talk that way. Good leaders are, they're up in stages four and five all the time, and that is dead wrong. Leaders do talk stage two, and if you want evidence, look at uh, Churchill's speeches during World War II, his radio addresses. A lot of them would actually start out by saying, 
as bad as you think things are, they're actually much worse. Now, why would he do that? Because he knew that people can only hear one sort of stage above and below where they are. So if you get a whole population that's at kind of stage one, stage two, which was a lot of London when it was being bombed, if he came in with the happy land of, you know, stage five about how the British Empire is going to survive and succeed and with the hope of humanity, people would have said, this guy's clueless and turned off the radio even more depressed than they were before. So good leaders start that way. Martin Luther King started his famous speech really in stage two. And then he moved to stage three. The most famous line we know is, I have a dream. You know, it's great to ask people the question, what is that What is that stage, or what is the stage of that statement? And a lot of people say, oh, it must be five because it's Martin Luther King. No, it's stage three. He said, I have a dream. He didn't say, we have a dream, that would be stage four, or there is a dream, or, you know, America has a dream, that would be, you know, one of the higher stages. He said, I have a dream. Here's my dream. I want to share my dream with you. Well, by making it personal, he was connecting the people at stage two and three and four. And then he moved up, and he talked about what this community was going to do that was rallying around the values of justice and equality. And then the speech ended with stage five, where he talked about all of God's children. You know, no one left out. That's pure values, that no one's left out. It's values being life-giving. So the, the point of all of this is that leaders need to figure out where people are around you. You need to talk at the level where they are and then progress one level at a time, bringing them up with you as you go. And you don't really want to leave them until you, you get them at least at stage four, maybe even going all the way up to stage five. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, on on your, your speech that uh, is on TED.com, you actually, I believe, say the, the, the Declaration of Independence was, was written at a stage two level, but the is, is that accurate that it was written at a stage two level, but it, they're, they're really at stage five? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the people in it were certainly capable of, of I mean, it's called amplitude, you know, or uh, you need to be able to, to go up to five, and the people who, who were involved in the writing of it could certainly do that. By volume, most of it is at stage two. It's an indictment of King George. It's saying our lives suck because we, lo- we live under this tyrant, and King George did this and King George did that. That's a long list of his crimes. So, again, why would the framers of that document, one of the most important documents ever written, go to stage two? Because they weren't writing it for historians. They were writing it for the people of the day. They were writing it for the people, you know, in the colonies. And a lot of them were facing starvation and disease and a lot of you know, an economic depression. So you had to write that way. And then you connect with people at that level and then move on to stage three, stage four. Besides stage two, the next most common stage is four, about you know, in, inalienable rights, and, and ultimately that even goes up to five. So, again, great leaders have the ability to have that amplitude. They can go down to two. They can talk that way without feeling like they're, they're losing themselves or somehow they're just joining a gripe fest. But you've got to go down and you know, kind of rescue people down there and bring them up. You've got to be able to talk with people at stage five, but you've got to be able to adjust. Again, Desmond Tutu does that really well. When he's talking to people that are, that are dispirited, he doesn't come across like a weird guru type. You know, he comes across like a normal guy who's, seeing things that are not going well, and, and he understands it. That's yeah. what leaders have to be able to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that leads us to what I think will be most valuable to everyone listening, is how do they take the understanding and knowledge of this and connect themselves with uh, other people, connect tribes, and basically uh, become leaders uh, so that they can you know, get to better places for themselves individually and for others. So if I could uh, ask you um, to kind of maybe define or talk about, you know, what's the essence of connecting and connecting tribes so that, you know, they can connect to something greater than themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing you as a person need to do is know your values. And based on that, you need to find other people who know their values, and maybe they know their values because you point them out. And then you connect people, you web people together by pointing out values they have in common and also linking those values to something really tangible, to an initiative, a project, you know, something. So one of my favorite examples is this woman in commercial real estate named Darla Longo. She's got this party every year. She, she's a broker for C.B. Richard Ellis, which is a company that John and I have done a lot of work, and Haley, too, have done a lot of work for over the years. And every year she's got, a, you know, this party of the top, you know, whatever it is, 1% of people in the commercial real estate world. And... 
and so every year at the party, all these people who don't know, you know, they don't know each other, they come up to her and they, she's sort of at the center of the party, and they just want to thank her for the invitation. Instead of doing the stage three thing, you know, wow, look at everybody having fun at my party, she looks at who they are. She knows two data points about every single person. She knows their values, and she knows their business pain points, and she connects them. So, wow, you two happen to come up here at the same time. You know, remember, and she turns to one of remember you were telling me that you could source, you know, those deals, but you really need financing, and it's tough to get financing, and then she points to the other person. He can get you that financing. I'm telling you, you two need to trade business cards. There's so much business to be made here. And then she gets in a little closer, and she'll tell them something about values. Like, you know, you may not know this, but, uh, you know, John here. Uh, I know you're really into education and, and you're involved in your kid's school and that's just a passion for you and you might want to someday retire as a teacher. You may not know this, but, you know, Fred here used to be a teacher, you know, years and years and years ago before he joined, you know, Morgan Stanley. I and mean, she's got all these stories about people. And so she connects them at the two levels all the time, the values and then some mutual gain, you know, some mutual interest. And that's all she does all night long. And more business gets closed in one night for Darla as a person then gets closed by whole offices of brokers over a year. So it's just so incredibly effective. So you just kind of reverse engineer that story. It, it tells you everything you need to know. You need to know your values. You need to find people who are playing a really big game who don't necessarily all know each other. You need to find their values individually, and then you need to make these connections. These We call them triadic connections, you know, triads and three, three-person relationships where you're connecting people to ideas and projects in each other. And by the end of the party, you know, everybody leaves and they found all these new contacts and it's so great. And, of course, the first thing they do if, after they've been introduced and Darla's kind of moved on is they talk about Darla. So she gets all this reciprocal benefit for doing it. So that's really how you do it. I love it. I love it because uh, in, in a lot of ways, um, and, boy, that, this will just sound totally stage three, uh, it, for me, you know, because that, that's one of the things that I actually <laughs> always want to do is, is just find people that are what what I would like to think of as, as industry transformers, which is a Dan Sullivan uh, term, and connect them with other industry transformers so that uh, great things happen. And I love doing that. I mean, it gives me a, a tremendous amount of personal satisfaction. However, it really uh, it really helps connect people uh, to each other, and, and even with uh, me having this conversation with you in this interview uh, is connecting your knowledge and wisdom to lots of people out there so that it could uh, just uh, evolve them and enhance them and and, and I get uh, you know tremendous uh, joy um, for you know all the different purposes that it feeds me financially ego and just knowledge wise but I, I love learning and, and and then I love connecting people with the learning because if it just stopped with me I would feel in a lot of ways kind of empty um, but I love just connecting smart people with other smart people, and especially industry transformers, because you know what what I would define as that someone that that literally can go into an industry and and, and change it and transform it in so many ways. I mean, in your world, you're, I would consider you an industry transformer, and the more that you can connect those types of people together, uh, all the better. Uh, which I think, in, in a lot of ways, is such a huge opportunity for everybody um, listening. So what advice would you have for people to improve their ability to go out and create uh, you know, triadic relationships? Um, well, again, know your values. Uh, know, be able to find the values of other people. And there, there are techniques to do it. It was one we call click down, which is essentially a process of asking open-ended questions until you get down to the the value below which there's nothing. So just learn learn how to do that. Just learn how to discover values. In some seminars that I teach, I go, I'll give people an instruction that it's your job over whatever lunch hour or between now and the time we start up tomorrow to find the values of five people that you, you could know them or maybe you don't, but to find the values of five people without tripping that kind of weirdo stalker alarm you know, that people have in their head. So you can do it with somebody who's taking your order at dinner. You can call you know, back home and do it with one of your kids. You can do it with somebody you connect with at the bar. But you've got to come back with five examples of how you found values without triggering the stalker alarm. Because one of the ways you do it is just by relentlessly asking closed-ended questions, and you, just, you get a weird vibe from somebody who does that, and you run screaming away. Uh, so that's one technique. Uh, another is just you know, kind of learn to do it. Uh, one thing, you know, I hate to mention this, but it's just it's certainly – you know, I think every, everybody who, who listens to it would agree, but it's maybe not the happiest news, is in order to really do this, you've got to be, as a person, really, 
really good at what you do. So when Darla triads, or Joe, you know, if you triad people, it works and it sticks. But you imagine somebody who's, you know, kind of a loser, they haven't really figured stuff out, and they said, wow, I'm going to be a tribal leader, I'm going to, you know, connect people. And so imagine, you know, that kind of a person, if they connected, you know, Joe, you and me, it just wouldn't stick. Cause, I mean, yeah, totally. You know, right, I mean, who are you? So you've got to be at the very, very top of stage three, ready to transition on to stage four. And if you're not really good at what you do, with a world-class following, with people, you know, lined up saying, this person has it. They, got, they are the real deal. They are a, you know, call it whatever you want, talented genius, whatever, you know, industry transformer. Unless you've got those people, you're not ready to try it. So spend the time to own stage three. Become really, really good at something. So good that people, you know, form that following because they want to be around you as a person because you're so good at it. Now the trick is not to fall into the ego trap and to flip it and to make it about the group and not about yourself. Ironically, it is about yourself when you're going through it, but then you've got to flip it. Because, yeah. you know, anyway, you see the point. If you don't develop yourself as a person, then you can't do all this other stuff. Great, great advice. I mean, absolutely true, too, because I've seen so many people attempt to, to connect when they're, they're just not... You know, it's like if you want people to talk about you, the whole famous word of mouth marketing thing. You know, you, right. you got to give. If, if, if you want word of mouth marketing, you got to have something worth talking about. And if you if you want to connect people, you got to you got to have something. You got to have the rapport. You got to have the knowledge base. You got to have the ability. And if you don't develop those skills and the understanding, it's it's just it's not going to hit the mark. So, in order to um, be a leader. Um, what is the what's the essence of leadership? Not just so we become leaders for ourselves, but literally for people that are able to go out there and do it for the world. What what is the essence of leadership as, as you would define it? Well, there's a couple definitions. One is making something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. That's from another book uh, that I wrote with a guy named Steve Zaffron called The Three Laws of Performance. And Warren Bennis was our editor on that book. He's kind of a famous guy in the leadership world. Actually, probably the most famous guy in the leadership world. And he really liked that because in politics and business and all these areas, you find leaders essentially claiming credit for what was going to happen anyway. You know, there's going to come a point in the economy when it's going to turn and, it, and everything, jobs are going to get better, housing prices are going to move up. And when you have, lead, you know, quote-unquote leaders who say, right, it happened because of me. And it, okay, this is BS. So a leader is someone who makes something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway, Okay. So another definition coming out of the tribal world is a leader is someone who builds great tribes to the point that the tribe then recognizes that person as the leader. So you put those two together, it's your job to form a tribe that does not currently exist, or maybe take a tribe that does exist but build it up to stage four, maybe even five, and then, and then as a result of the tribe doing what it does so well, make something happen that wasn't going to happen anyway. So, you know, Joe, a lot of the work that you're doing uh, you know, with with uh, with some of Branson stuff and those charities, those are things that would not have happened anyway. So it's not like you can point to something that was just you know inevitable and you kind of claim credit for it. You're cobbling together tribes, you're connecting people, you're pointing them in this direction, and something is happening that would not have happened anyway. That's the essence of leadership. Gotcha. Okay. So, well, can we create team members who are leaders? Is, is it possible to do that with your with your team, with your employees, or is that like an oxymoron? No, it's not at all. Now, management requires authorization. Somebody's got to come along and say, you are the manager. Or maybe if you're starting your own venture, you know, I'm the manager, I'm the owner. But leadership doesn't require that. Leadership happens out of permission, so other people grant you the permission to lead. So your team members can step up as a leader. You may need to grant them permission. In fact, they actually need to grant you permission, too, even if you're the owner or the manager. But imagine whole communities, whole tribes of leaders that's a stage four group. You know, uh, again, I, one of the reasons I get so upset about the, the Tony Shea message becoming all about Tony Shea in the popular press is there are so many leaders at Zappos. And when the story becomes about Tony, we lose all of those individual leadership stories. That's actually the gold, is the fact that Tony's found these great leaders, triaded them together, built cultures based on values, and then unleashing all of that energy in the same general direction. I mean, yeah, so everybody in a, in a tribe can be a leader. Yeah, and one thing I will say about Tony, because I know Tony pretty well. I mean, I've been to his home, we've, we've hung out, you know, and have had many drinks and dinners and, 
you know, I've, I've, I've been to Zappos a couple times. He's spoken at one of my conferences. I did an interview with him, which people can, listening to this, can find on Genius Network. Uh, dot com and it's actually a, a video of Zappos and you know Tony's desk which we show on on as part of my uh, interview with him um, I mean he's right in the middle of everyone else he does not have a lavish office it's just like right out there in the you know with yeah, a little cubicle like everyone else and you know he's a very you know kind of quiet guy so a, a lot of people that, that don't know who Tony is you know may may perceive this individual CEO of Zappos that you know sold to uh, Amazon stock that's you know currently you know worth over a, a, a billion dollars is this you know loud you know influential. I mean he's he's not like that at all. He's a very low key you know guy who's you know he doesn't sit and talk about himself about how great he is. I mean he, and he's just created a, a really uh, amazing you know company. Um, and, and I would just encourage anyone to actually buy anything from Zappos just to just to see the experience. I mean they're they're phenomenal. I'm getting ready to go to Burning Man as an example. Which before we end our our interview and our conversation here, I'd love because uh, I know you've been to Burning Man before. I'd love to get your perspective as it relates to, to tribes to this this whole thing called Burning Man, which many people have no clue what I'm even talking about. But but kind of <laughs> mark that as a checklist that we got to we got to fit Burning Man into this. But I bought some. Uh, Shoes for Burning Man from Zappos, uh, boots actually, because we're out in the middle of an alkaline, you know, sand desert. But uh, I mean, they were so helpful from everything from the for the boots to the socks, and it was just funny as hell. You can just mess with these people on the phone, and they laugh, and it's weird, and it's it's all cool. But anyway, I'm going on a little ADD tangent here. Um, <laughs> so, um, one thing I I want to ask you about. Um, in, in your opinion, are, are tribes more influential uh, than individuals, no matter how smart or talented the, uh, the actual individual is? Yeah, that's always the case. Yeah, the, the, the tribe's dominant. You know, and so even if you've got, imagine the you know, greatest leader ever, so like Jack Welch still gets a lot of, even though he's been retired for a while, imagine that you put Jack Welch in, in charge of the TSA. Who would win? <laughs> it wouldn't be Jack. Right, right. So and you you've, you also so what is that term you use that cu- culture uh, trumps the individual? I, I should have asked you that about, about back in culture, but can, can you um, when you're talking about culture? But can you kind of talk a little bit about that because I think it's just an interesting statement. Yeah, well, the statement it, it, nobody actually knows who, or at least I don't know who this who this comes from. It's been attributed to Peter Drucker, but I'm hearing now he may not have said it. But anyway, the line is that um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So you imagine a company, and they've got their strategy, how they're going to roll out new products and conquer the world and have great margins and money for everybody and you know, pay the stockholders and all that stuff. But the, they've just got a sucky culture. You know, what's going to win, the great strategy or the lousy culture? The answer again and again is the culture. So the culture ends up winning. And culture also trumps the individual. So, um, you know, it, again, it's just I, I get so irritated by a lot of these kind of crap business books. So... You know, sorry to keep going back to Tony, but let's just say that you followed Tony around and you just made a list of everything that Tony did, from how he drank his coffee to the kind of conversations that he had, where his cube was. You know, it's in the middle of this thing called Monkey Row with all these kind of vines hanging from the ceiling. He just kind of made a list of everything that Tony did, and then if you gave that list to somebody that was in a stage two culture and said, "Do these things, and then your culture will be great, like Zappos," would it work? No, not at all. So. The culture is much more important, you know, it's much more dominant in, it, in its force than the individual. But the individual, if they're really smart and savvy, using a lot of the, the, the techniques we've been talking about here, can actually reshape a tribe. You know, that's real art. That's real leadership. Again, that's what George Washington did. And without that, there would be no United States. So let me ask you about Burning Man. I'm getting ready to go for the very first time um, in a few days uh, at the time we're doing this interview to uh, to Burning Man uh, out in the middle of, uh, it's like 100 miles outside of uh, Reno, I believe, uh, in the middle of a desert with uh, 30-something thousand uh, people. And you've been there before. And uh, what's kind of cool, I was looking forward to doing this, this interview with you about tribes because I'm probably going to show up to Burning Man looking at all of these different people and themes and everything with a uh, a much different perspective of what is going on and what people, you know, kind of corral around their values, their interests, and that sort of thing. So how would you define Burning Man as it relates to, to, to tribes or groups of tribes? Well, it's it's a basically a big convention of tribes. 
so people show up often with their you know tribal members and their people who fly you know private jets in and rent really uh, fancy you know sort of RVs and their people who sleep on the ground with, with just a blanket over them. Um, but at the end of it, what you find is that a lot of people have now met other people, and a lot of a lot of new tribes have been formed. You know, old tribes are kind of morphed into new tribes, or people have to kind of new tribal members. I mean, there are people who are kind of a you call them special interest tribes that are like jugglers. You'll see jugglers there. You'll see like the nudist <laughs> tribe. <laughs> they kind of wander around, and there are the tribes of really horny people, and that's why they're there. And the fun thing is to see when somebody who's in one tribe starts to connect with a member of another tribe, and then you'll see their behavior kind of morph so that it's not really my behavior and it's not your behavior. It's kind of something that we make up in between ourselves. And then we, we, that's the genesis of a new tribe. And then somebody else comes and joins, and somebody else comes and joins, and maybe we go join another group, and now you got another tribe, and then after a while that kind of breaks down because the same thing happens over and over and over. And then when you come back and, you, and people have these great experiences, what they'll talk about isn't, oh, my God, I met the most amazing people. It's, uh, oh, my God, I met the most amazing groups. You know, and they'll talk about the people, but it's really the group that they became so fascinated by. And the, the thing that's just magic about that or any experience like that is when you as a person feel yourself really deeply, profoundly understood by a group, by a tribe, that this group gets me. There's just nothing better than that. Um, you know, you just, uh, I mean, that's just a moment of nirvana that you just want to capture. And a lot of people have that experience there, and then they come back and they try to, you know, replicate it in the real world. And it's a lot harder. But, you know, the last thing I'd say about that is just imagine that kind of a thing happening at work. You know, imagine that thing happening across companies around the world. You know, imagine where the economy would be. Imagine where the stock market, you know, not just the, in the U.S., but around the world would be. I mean, we would create more wealth that has ever been created in the history of humankind. And we'd have so much fun doing it. And the way to actually get there, I believe, is to first understand <laughs> that, that that's even a possibility and not be in one of the stages that is the liability cultures because, uh, in, you know, I think most of the uh, positive change in the world is uh, coming uh, not in stage one or two. It's, it's, it's going uh, above and beyond. Yep, that's, that's very true. So going back to many of the people that you talked about and values, uh, I, I will say one thing before I ask you about about your vision, uh, so get ready. Um, I have a, uh, a friend named Glenn Morshauer. He's an actor. On uh, you know, Many people know him from 24. You know, he was on every single episode. And he's, uh, you know, currently uh, spent, he's done more military roles on movies and TV than any other living actor. And just a, a really incredibly nice guy. He's very happily married for many, many years. And, uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Glenn just talking about, you know, the Hollywood business and, and people and relationships and, and whatnot. And I uh, had a conversation. I spent about four hours with him a couple of weeks ago uh, while I was speaking at an event in Vegas, and, and so was he. And so afterwards, we uh, you know, just kind of sat down and had a very, very long lunch. And I asked him about why is there so much chaos with uh, celebrities and actors with uh, addictions and, and drinking and just out of control behavior, which you see all over the news and stuff, uh, because he, you know, just seems to really have his act totally together, um, and he just is a really grateful human being. And, and you know, I've, I've, I have a few, uh, you know, pretty well-known clients that if I hang out with them, they're getting mobbed by people and asking for autographs all the time, and. Some um, you know some people are just not nice and others are very gracious and he's just a really you know grateful for his fans grateful for his his opportunities and stuff and I I asked him I said you know why is there so much craziness with you know actors entertainers athletes and stuff and he said well he goes it's one of the businesses that if you don't know yourself before you get into it it can and will consume you and does that with many many people. And it was interesting when you were when you were talking because it reminded me of you, you said that you know the, uh, the the leaders really know themselves better than other people, and that seems to me that the people that really have their act together that I know you know know in the world really they do know themselves and they know their values and they develop them and they spend time really working on them and they tend to be the ones that are the producers of the world. Uh, not the parasites, because there are a lot of parasites, and, 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 and I think there's a lot more parasites in, in, 
different cultures and different tribes and there are producers. And so when it comes to really um, doing great things, uh, you have to have a vision for a better world, and, and there's got to be a purpose behind it. So um, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, um, you can talk about yourself or you can talk about the whole perspective of vision in general. But uh, first, let me you know, what's, what's your vision, Dave, of a, of a better world? Because one of the things that I heard you um, say uh, during a speech with uh, my good friend Evan Pagan, who was the one that introduced us, um, you said the world's not as cool as it could be. And so I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, what's your vision of a better world? Well, since people have, who have gotten to this point in the recording, they're up on the terminology, uh, my view of the way the world should be, can be, uh, and will be is a world where everybody has the opportunity to be part of a, of a vital community, you know, of a community that's at stage five. Now, not everybody will want to do that, and that's fine. You know, talking about the whole Hollywood culture, living in L.A., I'm, I'm inundated with that, you know, which is completely stage three, and reality TV, which is completely stage three. So not, not everybody will want to do it, nor should they be forced to or compelled to. And even if you tried to, they couldn't do it anyway. But I go to parts of the world where people can't even imagine stage five. They cannot even imagine it. And here in the U.S., we can, we've can we caught glimpses of it from time to time. Our own national history has some stage five moments in it, so we can kind of, you know, sort of extrapolate that out. But when I ask people, have you ever had a stage, have you ever been part of a stage five group that had anything to do with work? A uh, vast majority will say no. You know, 99% will say uh, not that I can remember. And that's tragic. That's really tragic. And then when you say, how many of you have really been a part of stage four, most of them will remember it, but a lot of it you know, is going back to college when they were part of a fraternity or something. It doesn't really involve work, but how many of you, have, you know, had that at work? And again, it's a really small percentage. That's the thing we need to fix. And if we could do that, back to the thing about the world is not as cool as it could be, you know, we are um, a friend of mine, uh, Steve Pianodosi is his name. He's the uh, director of the, of the uh, Cancer Institute at Cedar sinai He's both an MD and a Ph.D., and he's a fan of saying that if we discovered the cure for cancer, you know, we the world, we the whatever medical community, we wouldn't know it because it's going to exist in these little pockets and nobody will have aggregated the little pockets. And I, that's an example of the world not being as cool as it could be. I mean, imagine not just with cancer but with anything, with nanotech or a computer technology or where all this stuff is going, that all of those pieces could connect to the other pieces and, and all this stuff would accelerate and you know, build momentum. I mean, we could create such a cool world so quickly that people would look back generations from now, regardless of how it plays out, and say this was the golden age, you know, right now. And I think we can do it. In fact, I don't even think it's that hard. So that's my vision. That's awesome. That's awesome. So for everyone that is uh, listening and then now have, I think, a pretty deep perspective if they were really paying attention to what it is that, uh, th- that we're talking about here, um, and they really want to evolve their interactions and relationships with the world, uh, I'm going to, of course, recommend uh, that they read Tribal Leadership. Um, using that as a roadmap, what are some of the possibilities uh, for all of our listeners in terms of their lives and their businesses if they really uh, developed uh, the – I mean, what have you seen uh, positive benefits of people that have, let's say, for instance, read your book and have really taken this on in terms of their ability to accelerate – their, their growth? I mean, what can happen to someone? Well, it, you measure it not by the person, you measure it by the tribes that they're a part of. So you, what, I often get you know, people emailing, and John and Haley do too, that will say, the stuff was great, uh, but I used it at home, and now I've got a stage four family, and it's so cool. You know, we, we used to have all these, you know, whatever squabbles about stuff, and it just kind of went away, and it's not a lot of drama, and it's just, it's fun, and it's easy, and um, nobody can kind of figure out what we did, you know, but I don't know, we just, you know, kind of figured out as a family what, what our values are and committed to those and built our life around it. And a lot of people are members of, of religious organizations, you know, churches and synagogues and things like that. And the truth is, like any tribe, most of those are stage two, three, a little bit of four. Uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of religious organizations and spiritual groups, too, are about power. They're really not about the thing that they should be about. And I get people saying, you know, I use this at church, and, uh, you know, we've now got like a little stage four group, and it's really cool, and among other things, we're, we're doing stuff for the poor, and we're 
you know, just on fire, and we're just having so much fun. And, I mean, I've literally gotten that from Muslim groups and Jewish groups and Christian groups and uh, Unitarian groups, and, you know, that's wonderful. So families and then, and then in all of those little areas that you're a part of, most, of, most people listening to this, you know, we, when you're at a certain level of success, you're probably on a bunch of boards, nonprofit boards, and you probably lead a couple of them, and for-profit boards too. But same thing, make those tribes great. So what I look for is every single tribe that someone is a member of is made better because that person was a, was a part of it. You know, they've upgraded all those tribes. That's what's possible. Awesome. That is fantastic. So, uh, Dave, uh, first off, I really, really appreciate you uh, taking the time to, to share your thoughts, to share your knowledge, to share your wisdom. I, I also appreciate you and your, your co-authors and, and you know, taking such an expansive subject and, and researching it and putting so much work into that and then documenting it and writing about it and putting it out into the world so that you can share all this. So, so and anyone that does something like that, is, it's, it's a tremendous contribution. And what I'd like to ask uh, all the listeners um, is to read the book, Tribal Leadership. Um, give a copy of this interview to everyone in your company that you believe uh, will get it and, uh, and and utilize it as a roadmap to help you better develop and evolve your ability to connect, to develop relationships, and to develop leaders, uh, not only within yourself but within other individuals. And uh, share this because I think this is uh, such an important uh, message. And what's great is there's no bullshit in it, too. I mean, there's there's so much crap that is out there um, that tells people how to make things work. And, you know, and you can read the book and realize, you know, here's the things that actually do bring people together and here's the things that don't. And, uh, you know, uh, it, I think this is the uh, basis of creating tremendous amount of value. And one of the things uh, on the cover of the, hard, uh, the hardback uh, copy says, leveraging natural groups to build a thriving organization. And so... Uh, I love leveraging and I love thriving organizations, and the book Tribal Leadership will help you do that. So uh, any famous last words, and then we'll call it a wrap. <laughs> Just, you know, go out there and try it. Just try it like mad. That's what a lot of this stuff comes down to. Just see what happens. Have fun with it. Make it a game. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. This has been great. Hello, this is Joe Polish. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this interview. I hope you found it very useful. Please give me your feedback on all of the interviews that you listen to. I'd love to hear your feedback so we can always deliver a great program for you. Our website is www.joepolish.com, and we also have a Joe Polish Recommends section, so you can take a lot of the ideas and concepts that you hear on my Genius Network interview series and apply them to your business and find vendors and resources. You can go to joepolish.com to find that information and click on the Joe Polish Recommends section. And also, if you would like to find out about more interviews and invest in more useful Genius Network series interviews, go to www.joepolish.com dot geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and eat your competition alive.